Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi and welcome to Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and in this episode, we are going to be continuing on our building series. This is our part three of our rifle building series, and we're going to get into rifle stocks. In particular, talking about molded or composite stocks. But without further ado, here we go. All right, so... Rifle stocks and building a custom rifle. When we get into building custom rifles, I often describe the stocks as where the rubber meets the road. And they can cause all kinds of headaches and issues. And I know we've talked about stocks a fair amount on the podcast. But this particular episode is going to be things when you're building the rifle to look for. Some things to take into consideration when selecting some common problems you're going to run into when you're assembling the rifle or building it and getting it ready to go to the range. And the stocks we're going to go over in this particular podcast are composite or molded stocks, more of your traditional type, either McMillan's or Manners, or you'll see, you'll see that there's just a fair amount of them out there. That's going to be the focus of this podcast. The podcast next week is going to be getting into chassis stocks and getting into some particulars that we've had some experiences with that can either leave you exposed and having some issues or some things to look for when you're doing your final assembly to make sure that everything's right. So the rifle stock has really evolved from something that simply supported the lock stock and barrel, right? Um, it was usually to support the, the barrel and, the, and to hold the trigger mechanism in place while you're firing. As stocks became more and more current to what we are today, you, you got a lot of the wooden stocks that you'll see over the years that were more of your traditional straight combed style hunting stocks, narrow forearms. Sometimes they're banded to hold the barrel in place. And they were they were a great step forward ergonomically for us to shooters they did still leave a lot to be desired wood of course can have a lot of its own issues when it comes to dealing with elements of hot and cold uh, moisture compression as you're locking the barreled action into the stock and you're tightening those action screws so there's just lots of things that come into play and you started to see with very accurate rifles you start to see a lot of bedding going on, giving a very heavy or hard supported material under the action to keep the stock from compressing as much or deforming. And then in modern bench rest stocks, you'll see a lot of laminated woods that are glued, very strong. They control the moisture. They're sealed really well because that still can become a problem with uh, moisture and everything else dealing with the wood itself. And then, of course, you'll still see them bedded. Fast forward a couple more years, and you started to see the revolution or evolution of the stock turn into fiberglass and fiberglass-type stocks molded, such as the Macmillan, for example. When they came on the scene, of course, they made some military stocks, and what what they did was revolutionary or revolutionized the the stocks and allowed us to do some really cool things to them. But one of the things that I think was really important when the stocks took that next big step closer to where we're at today was that the materials that they were using were were inert or dead materials. So they didn't expand or contract in hot and cold. Uh, they didn't hold moisture. Uh, they didn't, you know, have these issues that traditional wood seemed to still have at the time. And so we took this major step forward. And, of course, we're talking about 30 years ago, 
that this the steps started taking place. And so you you fast forward to today, you're going to see a lot of stocks coming on the market that are molded or or done in a similar fashion. Some of the shells are now rather than fiberglass or are using carbon fiber, but they're still a shell with a fill inside to, to fill that void. And then, of course, they machined it out to the barrel channel and the action that you're going to use. Then one step forward, and I think this is we're sort of mid stride right now. And what I think is going to be the next step is going to be chassis spilling over completely into not just a tactical that we see it now, but you're going to see it spill over into the hunting arena as well. So Accuracy International, of course, with the AI chassis came out strong. A lot of militaries adopted it. It has been battle proven many, many, many times. Lots of militaries have carried it. And I always said, short of running it over with a pickup truck, I don't really know if there's much that you can do to actually damage it. It's machined aluminum with skins over it, so it doesn't suck all the heat out of your hands. The current design is pretty nice with the AX chassis. You still have the old AI-AT, and you can still get thumb hold skins to make it look like the traditional or the original AI chassis. But I think what we're seeing now is materials taking that next big step forward. I think you're going to see more chassis spilling over into the hunting community. And I don't want to say I think I actually know that there are some stuff being released next year at SHOT Show that's going to be really interesting that we're really excited about. And there's, there's reasons why, and I'll go over that when we start talking about the stocks when we're selecting a stock for our build. Where that goes from here beyond the machining of the chassis, I don't know. You know, is, is 3D printing going to come on strong? I know they're working with different carbon fiber resins and materials now that that allow them to print lots of really cool stuff that's really strong. You know, you just don't know. It's It's exciting to know that we're making these big leaps forward, but at, at the same time, we have to still work with what we have today. So we, we can't put off building our rifle until 3D printing comes on strong and you can print the stock at home with your printer on your desk. So in this episode, we're going to talk about molded stocks. And in particular, probably the two most popular out there, uh, Macmillan, Manners. Uh, you've got this um, AD Composites. You've got other stock makers out there. And I'm not an expert in what they do for a living, I've never been to any of their shops. I don't build stocks. I am not a stocksmith. I'm a rifle builder and a shooter. And what I find most fascinating is a lot of times the people that get into sort of revolutionizing a portion of the industry, for example, like McMillan, they were shooters first. And they recognized something that they didn't like or something that was weak or something that they thought they could do a better job doing. And they went and did it, which is pretty cool. I guess the American dream alive and well. So I'm not going to proclaim to be an expert at making their product or knowing everything about the process that they go through. But I do know a lot about building the rifles themselves and some of the issues that we run into here when we're assembling them and some things that you've got to watch out for. When you're selecting a stock, I always try to stay with a stock that's of really high quality. The reason being for that is we're not using Remington 700 actions or or those type of actions. There are other clones out there that are sort of quote-unquote custom actions. Uh, These things can warp and heat treat and have all kinds of issues we use uh, bat tactical actions and bat tactical elite actions these actions are perfectly straight true and round what that does is it allows us if the stocks are ordered properly to complete the rifle without bedding being required and this was a really important deal for me when I was building. I mean, we bedded a lot of rifles. And there was a gentleman by the name of Dick that used to work at McMillan. He has passed away since. And I've I've had the opportunity to talk to Dick several times 
over the years. And I really enjoyed his knowledge of stock building and his insight. One of the things that he had said to me once that really stuck, he said that as long as you're using really high quality actions that aren't warped and you get pillars installed at the factory, betting the rifle will do little to nothing to enhance the accuracy of the rifle. And 95% of the time will make no effect whatsoever. And it may be 5% of the time an effect, but it might not even be measurable. And so we ordered this, I think it was an HTG stock or something way back then. And he insisted that we build it a certain way. Um, I got that stock here. I had that stock at our shooting school for probably seven years. I never betted it. There had to have been... 10 different types of barreled actions of different serial numbers in that stock over the years because people would want to try it, and we'd simply just pull it out, stick it in, and shoot. And I would say that he's right. So when you're selecting a stock, there's some tricks to selecting it and getting it right to not have to go back and do these other really expensive things that may require a gunsmith or a competent person to do, but then also pigeonholes that stock to your barreled action it has no resale value because someone's going to have to mill it out and rebet it for the next rifle so it sort of takes away the value of the the stock itself when you bet it not to you but if you ever decide that you don't like it or you want to try something else it's going to be a lot harder for you to sell this stock that uh, dick had sent me we took it out to the Varmint Hunters Association back when they were running in Pierce, South Dakota. And we taught some long-range shooting schools there back in the late 2000s, early 2010s type area. And I took the stock out with me because it's more of a traditional hunting type stock. We had a young writer in the class. We had um, Daryl Thom from Bat Machine and his son uh, joined us out there. We had a, just a great group of guys. Some guys from Texas came up. And in the class, this young writer had never done anything long range before. And I had him set up on an Accuracy International chassis that was one of our school guns. And it was chambered in 223. And we, back in those days, we hand loaded for the rifles, shot him to 1,000 yards in every class. Just a great, great time. And he had said in the class, you know, maybe on the second day. So we do a classroom in the morning range time in the afternoon. And he had said that, Hey, Jamie, I really like the AI stock. You know, it's really cool and all, but I'll never shoot anything like that. It's, it's It's not anything that I would use. The other stock you have on display up there that we talked about earlier, that Macmillan, could we possibly fit that to my rifle? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, easy. And so during break, I... I took the barreled action out of the AI chassis. I dropped it in the Macmillan, fastened it all up, and uh, handed it to him. And he was like, am I going to have to re-zero it? And I'm like, no. Is it going to mess with that? No. It's going to shoot just fine. And in all the times that I've done this, I can't think of a time that I actually had to re-zero the rifle. Again, as long as they're made right, aluminum pillars, barrels free-floated, nothing's touching the barrel, it's still being held in place where it's supposed to it doesn't matter what's holding it he was he looked at me with that look you ever see someone like sort of tilt their head and give you that look like i'm hearing you but i'm not quite buying into what you're selling yet well we went to the range that afternoon his zero absolutely spot on from what it was the day before and he scored a first round hit in south dakota wins at a thousand yards that 223 so he couldn't have peeled him off the gun He was just having an absolute hoot with it. But that was a good example. Like if you order the stocks right, and we're going to go over this here in just a little bit, some things to pay attention to, you can bounce different rifles in different stocks too, which is sort of cool. Like, you know, you have this tactical stock and you have a hunting stock. Well, you can take that that barreled action out, put a carbon fiber barrel and put it in your hunting stock. Or if it already has a carbon fiber barrel, bounce it over to your hunting stock. And there you go. You got your your varmint gun or, or your your elk gun or whatever you want to make it to be, but you don't have to dedicate a stock to an action. You can sort of bounce them around a little bit. It's sort of nice. So that was just a really good example of that. And I've got a, over the course of the shooting school, which I think has been just like a godsend because you get a chance to see this stuff. Everybody talks about opinions, 
But we get to actually experience this happening in the field all the time. I'm just very fortunate to get to spend lots of time with lots of great people on the firing line. And I get to watch the cause and effect and, and swapping all these parts out. And, and we do it not just once and not twice, not, but we're talking hundreds and hundreds of times. We've, we've been on the line with, with rifles and changing stuff. It's, it's really fascinating. So when you're ordering the stock, if you order it right, you shouldn't have to bet it unless you're using a lesser quality action. And to be quite honest with you, you can bounce it to a different stock and not even have to really re-zero it. So let's get into the McMillans first. You can take everything that I'm talking about with the McMillans and you can apply it to all the other stock makers out there. There's, there's a lot of molded stock makers. So the things that I'm talking about are in reference to McMillans because we use a lot of their stocks to build our hunting rifles. But the same advice that I'm giving you or the same things I'm sort of pointing out are also the same things that can come into question or cause some problems with other stocks. So it really applies across the board. I'm just using McMillan as an example. When you order a McMillan stock, or any stock for that matter, if you can, unless it's made out of a material that will not crush, which McMillan offers several different types of fills that go into the action area, some do not crush. So you could tighten the stock up and it, it won't won't compress that material. With that said, though, I still get aluminum pillars installed at the factory. That is right out of the gate. Always get the aluminum pillars installed. I believe it's like $18 a piece or something like that. It's, it's, it's next to nothing for when you get into the total cost of the stock. But boy, that will make just one heck of a difference when you're shooting because it gives that action something solid to rest and grab a hold of that won't compress so aluminum pillars i always order our stocks here with an adjustable length of pull and an adjustable cheek piece and we try to stay with stocks that allow us to do that the reason we do that and it, it does add an expense and it adds weight by the way you know we we were talking about hunting stocks and chassis the subject came up about stock weights and you know when you add all of this stuff it adds weight to the stock but if you don't allow yourself the opportunity to play with that length of pull and adjust the cheek piece up properly to fit you well you may really n- never learn to drive it to its full potential because it's never going to feel completely comfortable and so what I found over the years is a lot of people are convinced that their length of pull is a set 13 and a half or 13 and three quarters. You know, they know their length of pull. But what I found over the years is if you give somebody the opportunity to play with the different length of pulls, what happens is, is they'll take spacers in, they'll take spacers out. And then all of a sudden they'll be like, wow, that, that actually feels really, really good. Huh? Would have never thought that. And they're going to shoot it for a while. And then they're like, wow, that's awesome. And, by happy accident, them and that stock together work best at whatever, 14 and a quarter rather than 13 and three quarters. And so giving yourself that opportunity to experiment a little bit may just be that last missing piece for you to really make this really good bond with the stock that it just feels great when you're shooting it. So if you find yourself behind stock and you're always fidgeting and you're not quite comfortable, your hand's too close to your shoulder, your firing hand, you're, you're too scrunched up on it, you have to push the scope forward because your face is too close, you know, these are signs that the stock is not fitting you well. Compound that problem with the fact that we hunt four seasons. We varmint hunt in the summertime and, you know, from varmint hunters hunting coyotes to big game hunters when it's 10 below zero. And boy, you really start stacking on some clothes, your length of pull changes. And that, that rifle that fit you great all summer long in a, in a light jacket or a t-shirt now really feels awkward to shoot because you've moved that scope several, you know, an inch forward of your face because you've got all this insulation plus a heavy coat over top. And now the rifle's pushed way far away from your face when you could just simply take two screws, loosen it up. Remove an inch spacer, tighten it back down, pull the rifle up, and you're like, wow, hey, that fits perfect, and you're off to the races. So just giving yourself that opportunity is worth its weight in gold. It does add weight to the rifle. 
you know, adding the adjustable length of pull adds weight to the rifle as well as adding the cheek piece. And so we try to stay with rifles that allow us to do this and we pay the price for the weight. You know, it's, 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 you can't have one without the other in the perfect world. We would have a, a 12 ounce stock that would fit us like a glove and can adjust everywhere, but it just, it just doesn't happen yet. The analogy that I would like to use with the stock before we move on though is picture back to like the 1950s, 60s pickup trucks, you know, single cab, big bench seat across the front and a fixed steering wheel. And let's throw in three on the tree uh, just for fun. Those trucks didn't have an adjustable seat that slid back and forth and they didn't have a steering wheel that went up and down and in and out. You were stuck driving it the way it was, whether you liked it or not. Some people, it was just really uncomfortable, didn't fit them well. Some people can't touch the pedals. You know, you get younger drivers, uh, shorter drivers. You know, you get someone that's really tall and they're jammed up on that steering wheel because they got nowhere else to go. There's no room to slide the seat back or give them a... This is what you're doing to yourself when you order a rifle without some adjustability is... You might as well just go out and buy a 1960s pickup truck and run that for your daily driver. And you're just going to be uncomfortable. It's never designed to fit everybody perfectly. When you order your stock, of course, now you've got some carbon fiber coming into play, which I think is nice. You still have fiberglass and I believe some other materials that you're going to see in molded style stock, but they're actually machined. And we'll talk about those in the next podcast, but I'm not 100% convinced that between the carbon fiber and the fiberglass, I I know one's stronger, technically speaking, carbon fiber, but I still shoot a lot. And I have noticed on some of the different designs of the stocks that they flex just as much as the fiberglass. And in one or two of the shocking cases, it seemed, in my opinion, that they might have flexed more. And what I'm talking about is you're on a rifle prone, cheek well, cheek pressure, and you're putting some pressure on the gun, and you can sort of watch the bipod push up on the tip of the rifle. So whether you order it fiberglass, whether you order it carbon fiber, I'm not far enough along in my experience with both to say that, yeah, just order the carbon fiber. They're stronger. I'm not going to go there yet. I think they look beautiful. I think they save a little bit of weight for sure. I'm not 100% sold of whether there's a big improvement as far as the flexing of the stock. Uh, That part, I'll just throw out there. They're good. They're not terrible, and they're not degrading that, but it didn't didn't address that issue in itself. A couple other things to take into consideration when you order a stock. Let's just say we're going to stay with McMillan right now. I don't like the Limb Saver recoil pad, and this isn't a, a knock against Limb Saver at all. I, in a Magnum or heavy hitting rifle, you're probably wise to get it. I always order the standard recoil pad with the adjustable length of pull, and here's why. The Limb Saver has like this gummy type material that it's made out of. And what I found as a shooter or while I was hunting is, especially if I wore a backpack or something, if you pulled the rifle up, that rear recoil pad would grab and stick on stuff so you're pulling it up to shoot and it it's it grabs on your your strap your backpack or it's tugging and pulling on your clothes because it, it's got this like gummy type material to it so i always unless you need the the recoil reduction then of course go with the limb saver but if you're staying with a moderate caliber that, you, that you're either going to suppress or break or that you're okay with a little bump on the shoulder I always opt for the standard recoil pad with the adjustable length of pull and integral uh, cheek piece that you can raise up and down. I do like the two-inch front rail that you can get on the Picatinny rails now. I think if you're shooting a bipod, I I like Harris bipods a lot. Don't get me wrong on this one. But I think stuff like the Atlas gives you a little bit more versatility with tilting the feet forward to shoot downhill. Adding leg extensions, different types of feet. And they're, they're not really spring-loaded, which is nice as well. And I like the 2-inch rail, not the 4-inch rail, because that 2-inch rail gives me real estate between where the rail stops and the trigger guard. And so I can slide the rifle back and forth on a pack or on a tree branch or something without too much rail sticking out that's going to bump or grab into something. I also use flush cups. I don't use any slings 
swivel studs on the bottom, on the rear, on the front. This is personal. This is just personal opinion. I use flush cups usually on the bottom is my favorite. And you can get them on this side, of course. So if you're a right-hand shooter, get them on the left side. And when you throw your rifle over your shoulder, you won't have the bolt knob sticking in your back. And it just rides really nice. But for traditional style shooting, I actually prefer flush cups on the bottom because when you sling up, it still feels pretty natural to me. With the the flush cups on the side, when you shoot with the sling, it sort of, sort of feels a little different. Uh, maybe with more practice, that would feel better. I guess if you wanted to, you could do both. You could do the flush cups on the bottom and the side. That's sort of the nice part about having a custom stock made is it's really no big deal for them to add two extra flush cups. Uh, another attachment points for swivels, which is nice. So I always order those as well. And I use M5 from Seekins Precision Bottom Metals. I like Badger. I like Seekins. They're my two absolute favorites because they're so predictably well made and they're made correctly from batch to batch to lot to lot. So if you get the stock, you know, you're going to call McMillan up and you're going to order a stock and you're going to say, hey, I want a McMillan A3-5. I want flush cups on the side. I want two inch front rail, aluminum pillars installed. And I would like it inletted on the bottom for the Seekins M5 DBM for detachable box magazines. And then you can use MDT magazines. You can use AI magazines, all of those. So I like to use that type of bottom metal and for more than one reason too because that heavier piece of aluminum that that solid piece of aluminum you're using on the bottom of course you've got your action screws going through that that really gives it a nice footprint to grab on the bottom and grab the action from the top pull it down and good flat surface areas to keep everything straight and true so big fan of Seekins, big fan of Badger, I think really great to go, but you have to be sort of be specific when you order it from McMillan and say, hey, we're going to use a Seekins M5 DBM, we're going to use a Badger M5, something like that. What we do beyond this is, you know, besides the Keller option that you have to go with and the stock designs, is the fill that goes inside the stock itself. So here's something really important to pay attention to that I think if left alone, when you order your stock, they're going to put in what they think most customers want, right? If you know what you want, they're going to fill that stock with different materials that I think is better. So I'm going to share with you some things that I think if you're going to order a McMillan, that may be considered doing at the expense of a couple ounces of weight, but making a much more rigid, solid stock. Because I always look at rifles that I want to shoot them first. I, I love shooting long range. I really enjoy the art of shooting, but I like to shoot accurately. You know, I want to hit little things at distance. I, I don't want to shoot one-inch groups. I don't want to, you know, miss a four-inch plate or six-inch plate at four, five, and 600 yards. And when we talked about earlier, the stock is where the rubber meets the road. And the fill material that, that you use can help add a lot of rigidity and sturdiness to the stock itself, which I think helps a lot. And so they have different types of fills. I'm not going to go into huge details. You can talk to McMillan about this if you like. But they have different type of fill materials that they use in different areas. I want you to remember this. E-W-W-E-E. -E -E. That's E as an echo. W as in whiskey. W as in whiskey. E as an echo. E as an echo. What that stands for is it's edge fill, Weatherby, Weatherby, edge, edge. That is the fill material they're going to use from the tip of the stock to the recoil pad. And one more thing. The Weatherby fill is to be plus two inches in front of the recoil lug. If you do nothing more than remember that, it's going to make a really solid, sturdy stock. They make different types of fills that they fill the shell of the stock with some of them are really soft so you can get an edge stock which will be completely filled with edge fill you have to get aluminum pillars installed with that because it can compress it makes the stock lighter but in my opinion it also makes it flex a little bit more especially with that recoil lug area because we're hollowing that area out it doesn't have all that material to keep that stock from flexing at that point point. and so what i've learned from experience is i don't mind the edge fill in the, in the cap 
But then when we move back to the action and recoil lug area, the rear of the action, I want that to be Weatherby fill. And then the butt, I don't care about it. The butt doesn't flex. It's a solid, you know, piece. Edge fills absolutely fine back there. You've got a lot of beef and material. It's not going to flex through that area. You can get an entire Weatherby filled stock, or, and you can even go and get solid fiberglass if you really want a heavy stock. But I think a really good, and they consider it like a, a field sniper fill is what I guess I would classify it as. Um, you can get heavy sniper fill, which is complete fiberglass, I think, from end to end. But this would be more of a, a field sniper fill. So it's edge fill in the front at the cap, E W W E E. That stands for edge, Weatherby, Weatherby, edge, edge. And then just tell them that you want the Weatherby to, can, to be two inches in front of the recoil lug. They'll make notes on it. That's how they'll make the stock. And the reason that's so important is it, it keeps that stock really strong and keeps it from flexing where the action is and in front of the action through the recoil lug area. If you need help with this, shoot me an email or just write it down. Everybody there at McMillan knows this is the fill that we use here. I'm sharing with you some of the proprietary things that we do to our stocks that are different. But make sure that, that I think personally it's worth the extra couple ounces to really make that stock strong. And then get a full inlet. Our inlet channels are for the bat tactical action for the action itself. And then, of course, the barrel channel that we cut is a 338 Sendero Contour. It's a 338 proof Sendero Contour which is th- with a 1250 cylinder diameter and 3 inches long. So one two fifty wide, three inch long cylinder is what they call that, and they'll know if you tell them it's for Wolf Precision's rifles. They're three thirty eight inlet for the barrel channel. They'll be able to get you fixed up straight away, and that allows us to use both our carbon fiber barrels and our steel Krieger barrels in the same stock. So you're not pigeonholed to a particular smaller barrel or larger barrel. We have a barrel that that mimics each other both in carbon fiber for hunting as well as for stainless. So we order our stock, we get everything back, we're now ready to build the rifle. Here's a couple things you got to pay really close attention to when you're putting the rifle together itself, is make sure that when you tighten the action in, I always like to, of course, have muzzle up, so I'll I'll put the, the barreled action into the stock, I'll put the bottom metal in place, I'll put my front action screw, rear action screw in, I'll sort of hand tighten them a little bit and then I'll back them back off. Then I'll stand the rifle up, I'll tap it on the butt, making sure that that recoil lug is seated tightly against that surface area in the stock. So muzzle up, and then I'll I'll snug the front action screw, then the back action screw. Then I'll go back up to the front, and I'll tighten it, back down to the bottom, tighten it. And then I'll tighten them down to 55 to 65 inch pounds. With aluminum pillars and weatherby fill, you can do this. What I'm checking for at that point is I'm checking to make sure that I am free-floated the whole way up through the barrel channel. So not one sheet of paper, maybe a piece of paper folded two or three times. That's how much clearance I want. Especially up at the end cap. Pay particular attention to the end cap because molded stocks can can warp and move over time. And that end cap we find sometimes is just dangerously close. You'll slide a piece of paper through, it doesn't touch. But when you get on the ground and you've got your scope on, all the rifles loaded up, you put your face in the gun, a little, little cheek, cheek well, cheek pressure, and, and then you load the rifle forward on its feet, and then all of a sudden, you're touching the barrel with that end cap. There's a sharp edge that comes up at the end. If you can squeeze that together and it touches easily, give it some more room. And you just sand it out. Take a little piece of tape run down both sides of the stock. I don't put it in a mill. I actually, I'll start with something like 60 grit, 80 grit, 200 grit, 600 grit, and all I'm doing is very easily uh, working it around, making sure that I'm evenly sanding and opening it from the inside. Then I'll fit the stock, then I'll pull it back out. And, and if you do it by hand, it looks beautiful. It works out perfectly fine. Just don't take a whole pile of material out at one time. Take a little bit out, put the stock in. If you see that you're, you're taking a little bit more off the right side than the left side, you know, inside the barrel channel and start focusing more on the other side. But just take your time. It only takes, you know, 15, 20 minutes to do this. Make sure you have lots of clearance up there. Now, you don't need an inch of clearance, but you certainly need enough to get 
maybe a piece of paper minimum folded in half, but I would say even folded three times. Just, just there's no chance of that barrel coming in contact. Um, then also check your bolt handle. Make sure as you close it in a closed locked position that you can slide a piece of paper between it, the very bottom end of the handle closest to the stock, and the actual stock itself. Because you'll hear it if it touches. You'll hear tick tick. You know, it's it's not seating the whole way down. The bolt's not closing the whole way. It's hitting the stock. And usually you just have to take an edge off of there. So you, you take your stock out uh, of the barreled action out of the stock and you sand that area out till you can put your action in, close it, and run a piece of paper around the bolt handle between that and, you know, the actual handle or arm itself and the actual stock itself. And then I usually do a visual check. I'll use a little feeler gauge and I'll go around where the rear action screw is uh, at the top, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to feel in between the actual action and the stock itself, make sure there's no big gaps back around that rear tang area. I'll also do the same thing up by the recoil log. I'll stick a feeler gauge in there, and I'm trying to see if we got good contact underneath. And usually you can pull the stock out, and you'll see the marks both on the stock where it's touching as well as on the bottom of the action. So you just want to make sure that you're planted real well on top of those aluminum pillars, 99.999% of the time, that is not an issue. I think we've had one stock that had whatever a weird gap underneath the back tang, like it was almost like a savage where they were free floating the tang, um, still contacting the pillar in up front, but the whole back of the tang area was not touching at all. And we sent it back to McMillan, of course, and they fixed it, no charge, uh, and sent it back to us here. But just things to double check before you put it all together. And then I do lock them down when you get pillars installed. You can lock these things down at 55, 65 inch pounds and get them off to the races. And it's repeatable. You can take the barreled action out as many times as you want, put it right back in, lock it into the proper foot pounds, and your zero should not change. So we've talked a little bit about the McMillan. And I'll tell you that my, my two favorite stocks from McMillan are the Warden, which is what we build our pursuit on and the A3 or A3-5, and there's just a difference in the butt. Uh, one has more of a bag rider type butt. The other one has an angle like a hunting rifle. But the A3 and the Warden are my absolute favorite two McMillan stocks. I think the A3 is the perfect all-around stock that you could take out hunting, varmint hunting, predator hunting. You could take it to a match. We have had customers over the past eight years compete with an A3-5. And then, of course, you've got the A6, which I think is a fantastic stock. Uh, we did a video review on it as well. So, you know, just pay attention to when you're ordering the stock. Some really important details about the fill, uh, some, some pointers on the recoil pad itself, as well as some ideas. Um, make sure you get the aluminum pillars installed, two-inch front rail, is which is what we like, and then just flush cups. Make sure there's no studs sticking down off the rear of the stock itself to catch a rear bag or anything like that. Manners came on strong several years ago and, you know, makes a fantastic stock and they do carbon fiber as well. They do a nice job with their PRS line of stocks. I mean, there's just, there's the good part for us as shooters. There's just lots of good stocks out there. If you're going to build with a Manners stock, though, I have a couple pointers I want to share with you. And we talked about the things with the McMillan and you can talk about some of those issues with Manners personally about the fills that they use and, and talk to them about how you want a little bit heavier fill through the action area. But one of the things I wasn't able to accomplish when I was working with Manners years ago is, is I insist that we have aluminum pillars installed if it's going to be a molded stock. I'm not installing pillars here. I'm not bedding pillars in place. I've been there, done that. There's absolutely no reason for me to be doing it after the fact. It should be done and then machined into the stock. That's the right way to do it. Manners does not offer that, or at least they haven't up to this point. I do have a call in to, to Manners. I'm going to talk with them here shortly. And if I get a, a revise on this or an update, I'll pass it on on the next podcast. But they don't install the pillars when they're making the stock. What I do at Manners, rather than betting and trying to put the pillars in with the action, Manners offers a mini chassis system, which I thought was a fantastic idea. So mini chassis system gives a solid lockup for the action to mate 
inside the stock itself, just like it would with a chassis. And then it also works as a bottom metal, which I thought was really nice as well. So it it sort of kills two birds with one stone. So if you order a Manners, we talked about all the other things with the McMillan, same thing applies with the Manners, but get the mini chassis system. That way you don't have to mess around trying to either glue in pillars or bed in action in there. If there's a better way to do it, even though it might be a couple of dollars more, I would absolutely do it. So we've done a fair amount of manor stocks here. And in every case scenario, we get the mini chassis system. With that said, you still have to go through. These are still molded stocks and you've got to look for areas that's touching where it's not supposed to touch. So always double check your barrel channel you know, if you notice you're touching before you even lock it the whole way in, don't draw it in tight and damage anything. You know, start opening that barrel channel up. But if you order the contour right, again, you know, you can contact us if you use our system here. But if they inlet it right, you shouldn't have any issues with it basically being a drop fit, just like a chassis should be. The only exception you may have, and I think Manners is really good with the cha- the mini chassis, is the feeding and functioning because of how they set that in there. Should feed and function really well. Same thing when we use the Seekins Precision or the Badgers because they set the depth properly for our action. You put a magazine in there, it's going to feed and function you know, great the way it's supposed to. But some of the others can have some issues in feeding and functioning if they're not inleted properly or using other bottom metals that maybe aren't of the higher quality that might have some variations in both how it holds the magazine, how high up or low it holds it, that can start to turn into an issue. But as long as you stay away from that and maybe consider using the recommendations that that we recommend. And we don't get any kickbacks from any of these companies. We do business with them simply because we think the product is good. So you're going to go through and make sure everything has its clearance around the barrel, make sure everything's tightened in their proper foot pounds, and then you are completely off to the races. The one last point I want to throw out is make sure that it has, if it has that two inch rail up front, make sure you go around and check all the screws that are holding these things in place and make sure they're tight. We went out to the range once testing a rifle and put the Atlas bipod on and shot a couple shots and I was feeling the Atlas and I'm like, "Why, why does that feel loose? And I looked up and here they put the screws in for the two inch rail, but they didn't tighten them down hardly at all. And so it felt tight when I first put the bipod on there, but a shot or two later, the two inch rail was actually loosening from the stock. So we had to pull all that out, retighten it up. So make sure that you go through if it has any attachments or anything like that, two inch rails, make sure you go through and touch all those and make sure that they're all nice and tight uh, to spec and then you should be squared away. What do I think of molded stocks? Well, I'm anxious for what's coming. You know, I I think molded stocks had their time and place. And I I think for nostalgic reasons, they'll be around forever. I think a lot of people like the looks of them, the molded killers, the painted. I mean, and in the hunting realm, it really is hard to beat right now as far as uh, just a good quality stock. So McMillan is my favorite too, for sure. We stock them here all the time. It's what I personally use. And I've tried everything out there that i can possibly think of anytime i go to a show i'm always looking at new stocks and getting them here sometimes i'm buying them and then if i don't like them i'll give them to a friend or you know one of the one of the people that we work with that would like to try it and i'll just here take it and and go and use it but just be warned it's not quite what we would recommend here you know and they'll go and take it put it on our varmint gun and go have some fun with it so we test stocks a lot and a lot of them unfortunately don't really pass the quality that we're looking for because again the stock is where the rubber meets the road you put a bad stock on a good rifle and you've got a bad shooting rifle not because it's a bad shooting rifle but because it's it's a bad or poorly designed or improperly made stock so i just want to throw that out there that that's one of the things to pay really really close attention to so next week's podcast we're going to talk about chassis and some of the things that are up and coming in the shooting world Shot show this year, there's going to be a couple hunting chassis coming out, which I am really excited for. I think that's going to be the next big change is we're going to be able to use chassis in our hunting rigs now that are just as bomb proof and bulletproof as the Accuracy International was to the military that we can, you know, it rolls down the hill or somebody steps on it or the horse rolls over or, you know, lessen that chance of damaging it. Just something really rough and tumble. 
something that locks the action and holds it in properly, that's worth its weight in gold to me. And I think there's no better way to do it than to machine it. So I'm excited that there's going to be some new stocks coming out. We're actually going to have one of them here at the Great American Outdoor Show in February. I can't really talk about it right now. Uh, just that there's a really cool hunting stock that's coming on the market soon, and we're sort of excited because we think that that trend of chassis is going to start really bleeding over and making a difference in the hunting world. And why does that make a difference to you? Well, if we take an Oryx chassis that already exists, it's a pretty fairly light chassis. We built, I, I think we built like three or four elk guns this fall on an Oryx chassis, which costs three ninety nine. Bottom metal included. The only thing you have to buy is a magazine and a front picket any rail and you're off to the races and adjustable pool and adjustable cheek piece. But but here's the thing with it. It's a bolt in and go type system. And this is why I'm a big fan of chassis is we're not making a 35 ingredient recipe here. The stock is just one ingredient. We want to put the, the barrel action in. We want to lock it in place and we want to go. I don't want to play with it. I don't want to sand it out. I don't want to fix stuff. You know, I want it to be made right and done right. That's all it has to be is is it's five minutes to unbox it and bolt your rifle and wipe it all down and you're off to the races. And I I think that's the cool part of chassis. And I think that's where you have to pay attention with the other stocks to make sure you don't have an unforeseen problem come up and cause you some problems before you get out of the gate. Now, I will say this, though, just because they're a chassis doesn't mean they're good. There's a lot of really poorly made chassis out there and they have as many problems if they're not machined right as all of your other stocks, if not more. So it's up to the quality and the craftsmanship of the people that are machining it to make sure that it's done right and then everything else works the way it's supposed to. So just because it's a chassis doesn't mean it's it's problem free. It's still a man made you know, product, but done properly, it has a lot less issues for you to have to worry about and deal with. So we're going to talk about chassis in next week's podcast. I had two questions that I wanted to go over here. We had a couple phone calls. So we had someone ask about long barrels versus short barrels. I, I do say that I like shorter barrels better for accuracy, and plus I shoot suppressed. So here's my thing on short barrels, both for tactical shooting and for hunting. For hunting, I think 18 to 20... 18 to 22 inches is perfect. If it's a magnum stay at the 22 inch, you'll get a little bit more powder burn through it. But 18 to 22 inches is absolutely fantastic, especially with a heavy heavy carbon fiber barrel. For a match gun, 22 to 26 inches is fantastic. And most of the guns that I shoot are actually 22 to 23. The reason being is the shorter barrels have less harmonics. Combine that with the ace that dampens the harmonics. And now we've got a rifle that will shoot fantastic. And you don't pick up that much more velocity going beyond 22 and 23 inches. So, for example, at the shooting school, we have 22-inch barrels and 26-inch barrels. The 22-inch barrels are running 27.10. The 26-inch barrels can be running 27.70. I think we had one at 28.10. But you're getting somewhere between 70 to 100 feet per second total from 22 inches to 26 inches. That's 25 feet per second per inch, and that's a pound of barrel. So the barrels can weigh 3 to 4 ounces per inch, and it's hanging off the end of your gun. Now, a 10% return would be nice. You know, if you're shooting 2,700 feet per second and you get a 10% return for that additional length, well, that's 270 feet per second. That's a lot. But you're only talking about a 3 or 4% increase in velocity. I always stay, stay shorter. Suppressed, you pick up some of that velocity back again, which is nice, you know, 20, 30 feet per second. But the shorter barrels are inherently more accurate. Some of the most accurate rifles I've ever built in my entire life were 18 and 20 inch barrels. Just shot amazing. So I'm not saying to shoot a 20 inch barrel in a PRS match. But 22, 23 is a pretty good number. And then throw a brake on it, throw a suppressor on it. You're going to increase the accuracy of the rifle. You may give up 70, 80 feet per second, but hopefully you'll get some extra points just because you're able to hit stuff better. So shorter barrels. I had another customer ask about reloading. And he had said about, I had said in the shooting school, make sure that when you size or full length size your brass, put a bullet in that case that day. Don't full length size brass and then let it set for days or sometimes weeks and then go and seat bullets. And he was sort of, 
after the class, I guess, was sitting around thinking about it and wanted to reiterate it and asked if I'd talk about it on the podcast here. So when you're full length sizing brass, which is what I do, I full length size my brass. I don't I don't neck size. So I full length size, bump the shoulder back so I get perfect feeding and functioning. So when you put the handle down, you push that brass up into the full length sizing die. It's squeezing the neck. It's bumping the shoulder, pushing in the walls. When you pull the brass back out, it goes over an expander ball, opening the neck of the case back up to the appropriate size to accept the bullet. But what happens when you force the neck open is you've created a little bit of a spring there. So the the brass, if it sets for any long period of time, slowly wants to start to come back to that original size that it was forced to when it was forced up into the die. So you've made it small, and now you've pulled it over this expander ball and forced it open. Sometimes they want to close back a little bit. The reason you want to get a bullet in there right away is if you wait, you're going to get lots of different neck tension. So as you're seating the bullets, you'll physically feel them being harder or easier to seat from case to case. So you'll get a case, you're like, wow, that's pretty hard to seat. Well, not only that, but then as it's resisting the seater, it's also going to change your seating depth a little bit too. So if you're going to take the time to reload, whether it's 100, 200 pieces, I have a general rule that when I size the brass, I put a bullet in it. I make sure that I have time to finish the process to wind up with loaded ammunition at the end. So thank you so much. I know it's a little bit longer podcast than normal. I really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us here. As always, thank you for the emails and phone calls. Next week's podcast, we're going to continue right down to stocks. We're going to dive into chassis, some things to think about, take into consideration, help you build the best rifle that you can so you can actually go out and enjoy the art of long range shooting. So my name is Jamie Dotson. I am your host, and you are listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. <laughs>